Toby, thank you so much for joining me today and being on the podcast. I am really excited about this conversation. Hello. Hello. Having me. Yeah. So before um, we got on here, I pulled a card from my my super very favorite Oracle deck, which is Kyle Gray's. Do you know this one? Yeah. I, yeah. Kyle Gray's The Angel Guide Oracle deck, which I oh, love. Kyle Gray. Mm-hmm. And the card I pulled about our conversation is the sacred plan. Ooh. Ooh, and I love it. And so what it says in the book about the reflection for the sacred plan card is if you are trying to force a plan into action, the angelic guidance is to back down and trust in the greater good. Often when something isn't happening for us, we're frustrated, but it, that's only because we don't see that our perfect plan is unfolding. When your ideas or plans go wrong, trust that the universe has a greater plan for you. And yeah. that greater plan isn't something that has already been chosen for you. It's more of a culmination of all your life's intentions, prayers, and actions washing back toward you with opportunities and experiences. Well, yeah. That's so perfect. I had already thought of what I wanted to talk to you yeah. about because I know your story from listening to your podcast. Yeah. And this just really hit home. So I want you to share with my listeners what your story is and kind of how you got to be where you are with this awesome podcast mm -hmm. with a new membership of badass spiritual women, maybe men. I'm yeah. not sure. But um Kind of tell us what your story is. Of course, I would love to. So I um, discovered all of this kind of stuff when I was about 17, um, originally through The Secret, mm -hmm. as everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, good old Robert Byrne. Mm -hmm. And then I continued from that point onwards, after initially thinking oh, a lot of crap, to research it, to find out everything that I could about it and kind of experiment with it. And then I met somebody and lived with them and was fairly happy as far as I was concerned. We were getting married. Um, I had always planned to be able to teach the law of attraction and manifestation, law of assumption, spirituality, all of that. Not so much spirituality, actually, at that point. Um and then something happened. <laughs> so basically, I was getting married, and the groom to be didn't come on the day. So that was a bit of a shock, a serious yeah. kind of plot twist that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> um, however, I do feel like I might have manifested that a little bit because I really was focused at that point, or just before that, that I wanted to go in this direction. And I didn't know how I was going to go about it. And that was the turning point in my life where everything changed. I started the podcast and it was fairly successful quite quickly. And it's I feel like I'm very much on the right path. So that's all come from what could be perceived to be quite a traumatic event. But it was all because of that, that everything has happened as it has. And now I feel more on purpose and aligned than I ever have in my life. Right. So, yeah. So your great plan was picking a venue and picking this groom and going yeah. through all of it. And, and mm -hmm. you got the rug pulled out from under you. Literally pulled out from under my feet. It was the strangest scenario I've ever, I, I didn't really even know how to go about it because it's not like a common thing to happen. So I was like, um, who do I consult here about? Right. It was basically just like me and Carrie Bradshaw were the only people that I knew who oh, that's had a good that. one though. Yeah, I could like get involved. You have that. to be aligned with somebody. Let it be Carrie Bradshaw. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It, it's like I felt like you normally have someone to kind of turn to and say, "What do I do here?" And I felt very much like I don't know what I'm doing. Like I have no idea what's coming next because it was all of the future plans that I had and the like trajectory of my life that was all including being married to this man probably having children with him and and all of that was just like gone it was a very bizarre feeling the only way I can describe it is like grief really it felt like yeah. grief it felt like there'd been an accident and 
everything was just gone. But and yeah, and like you say, it's not it's not just the relationship; it's the whole no. future you had planned on. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And so, so you don't leave. You don't leave your wedding day and go home and be like, "Oh, the universe has a great plan for me." <laughs> no. Right? That wasn't that wasn't day one. I presume, <laughs> correct? It wasn't day one. No. However, I did feel like everything that I knew and that I'd come to learn helped me massively in those first few days Mm -hmm. because obviously it was quite a shock to the system but I had that complete faith that it was always going to be for my own good in the end and I never lost that faith um that's really impressive actually I think it was foundation was so sturdy that even in because that's a that's a real tragedy yeah even then you're not completely buckling under why me no. why did this happen you I mean you it was still trusted yeah absolutely it was the trust and I think that was as a result of the the two years prior to that my dad um it was like my absolute idol he was seriously ill with melanoma he had melanoma skin cancer and at that point it's I had no other option but to trust that he was going to be okay. And I put mm-hmm. all of my, every thought was always on the end result of him healing. Like I never let another thought enter my mind. So, and at one point during that, it went very, very bad on in the 3D. It spread to another area and it looked really like a, not a good outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just maintained, and he did, and everybody did, maintain that focus that he was going to heal and as a result of that massive dip came something really good where he was eligible for this trial treatment and he made a full complete recovery so then when that happened a year or two later I was like oh here's another one (laughs) like you know this is a (laughs) this is a serious plot twist but I took on melanoma I can take on exactly yeah yeah. so I kind of used what I'd learned through that experience through necessity for having to have that faith that it was going to be okay and that it was going to come good to help me through that next period of time so I always kind of thought yeah this is really shit like this is not good but it's going to be better and I'll see I'll look back and I'll see and I did so so it's not that toxic positivity where you're like, oh, no. this is perfect. It is owning your feelings, owning absolutely. your situation and knowing it absolutely yeah. sucks. Yeah. I had and really bad days. And, the light. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had all of that. Uh, I had really, really awful days where I was just crying my eyes out and I didn't know what to do. And then I'd be like, it's okay. Like, we're going to go keep moving forward. And it, it was just... You know, you, you had to just keep moving forward. Have, looking back now, I think I did put a lot of the feelings that I had about it off for a good year. Um, mm-hmm. It was only really probably a year after where I really started to process what had happened. Um, but throughout that, I, I knew it was, you know, it was all going to work out for my own good in the end. Mm. Yeah, I had a, um, I'll call it a starter marriage where, Nobody had the good sense to not go through with it, but either yeah. of us should have done that. <laughs> we should yeah. have been like, no, this is a bad idea. But mm-hmm. we um, quite luckily got out of that relationship after three years with no children, which yeah. um, which is like a, a great escape. <laughs> that you're, you don't have an 18 year commitment with somebody, but we could have done each other a favor. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I, I by still to this, those three years. <laughs> yeah, I still to this day, I wouldn't change anything about that. Like, I would totally. I, I'm I'm actually grateful to him that he did it because it would it takes a lot of balls to do something like that on the wedding day. I think most people would have just gone through with it and then gone through the whole getting a divorce and all of that. And, and I'm grateful that he didn't put either of us through that, right. um, despite what had happened and what had gone on, but. I just, yeah, I think maybe a little bit of notice would have been <laughs> no, other than right. that. I didn't have I to be in a dress. <laughs> yeah. And really, when I think about it now, that is the big event that has sparked me to change everything about my life and, mm-hmm. and move forward at such pace that I wouldn't have done before. So I wouldn't change anything about it, really. Yeah. 
So mm. it's interesting because it's such a cliche now that it's like, it's not happening to you. It's happening for you, but it really, really, really is like, it is a cliche, but yeah. also when you can, when you can change your perspective from the, the one of the field mice, you know, running through the fields, looking only at the blades of grass and kind of like elevate your perspective to see like, yeah. okay, things are playing out differently and I can't see yeah, the whole path ahead. Absolutely, yeah. I I, um, I went to a medium night once um, and something stuck in my head that he said and it was that when you are down here, it's like you're in a maze and you're trying to find where you're getting to and you're getting lost and delayed along the way and you might want to turn right but there's something blocking you and you have to turn left no matter what you want and he, he kind of gives the analogy that your guides and your angels and sources looking at the picture from above and they, you know, against your will might shove you down <laughs> an alley that you don't want to go because you wanted to go that way, but they know that that's going to be the right route for you to get you to what you really want and where you want to be. And yeah. I, I definitely resonated with that because I thought, yeah, because there's sometimes in your life where you just think like you can't understand at the time, but when you look back, you think, oh, right, you know, that's yeah. why that was the path to what I wanted. Yes, the path to what you wanted or the path to what you're called to do. And maybe you don't understand it now. And I've been given kind of pieces of my puzzle. And then I'm like, well, this is the direct route. Why am yeah. I not going this way? And it's uh -huh. like, sister you gotta learn you have to go through these experiences you have to grow yeah. like like you going straight to where you're supposed to do, to go doesn't give you the experience and know-how no, so, that you need no. like i would have not had any of the the confidence or the self-love or any of that to do what i'm doing now had i have done it back then because i had to go through all of those things and you will have to go through and everybody who's listening will have to go through all of those obstacles that feel really shit at the time to build that strength and trust in yourself that actually you can overcome anything and and you will get there but you need to gather that strength from hardship along the way before you do yeah and I feel like uh, the the trials not only, especially with a relationship trial, where I think a lot of times we can lean on somebody else for validation, mm -hmm. we can lean on them for so much. And then yeah. when you are left alone, you have to do a whole lot of soul searching oh, yeah. to find all of those things within you. Yeah. 100%. Which will then make you a great partner. Like once once you're healed up, you're like ready yeah. for a bomb diggity relationship, right? That yeah. you might not have been before. Oh. Definitely, a hundred percent. It's so true. Like, I will be in my next relationship. I will be such a better partner for myself and for them as a result of everything that I've had to learn. So, one of the things that I used to struggle with is being on my own. So, not as in like I couldn't be on the house on my own. I'd just get such paralyzing boredom and a need to be entertained constantly and needing to be around people to talk to me all the time and then I was suddenly just like right off you go you live on your own or you live at home with your mum and dad for the rest of your life in your 30s and I was like okay well I'm not doing that so I lived on my own and it was just the most bizarre experience and it forced me to spend a big chunk of my time on my own and now I've gone from somebody who needs to be with somebody and needs to be entertained all the time to somebody who's like locking my door and saging my house and like, yeah, when are you leaving? No. <laughs> I want to be on my own, like, because I, I, I love my them. own company. Yeah, like I still love people, but I don't need them. Whereas I, I, I used to need people around me all the time, and now I'm so much more comfortable in my own company, and that's a real blessing that I've got from having to spend yeah. time on my own. And I think that You're was not filling those voids with other people. You have Absolutely. filled them with yourself. Yeah, and it really you makes you look at yourself. person to give other people. Yeah, because yeah. you're forced to go into yourself and, and think, like, what is it that's coming up? Whereas you can distract yourself all the time with, you know, other people and never actually get to what it is that's going on for you. And you're kind of pushed into that when you're put in a scenario like that. And it, it's it's given me so much value from that experience. 
Yeah. So on this, uh, to help our listeners when they're going through tragedy, what mm -hmm. what were the tools and the techniques and things that you used to move out of that dark place to the other side? Um, well, I've got two, there's lots of things, but two in particular that have had the most profound impact on my life by far are uh, meditation. Mm -hmm. So particularly when my dad wasn't well, I was holding it together on the surface fine because I didn't want any doubt creeping in anybody's mind that he wasn't going to be okay. But my everything that was happening internally was coming out as really severe panic attacks in the night and I was scared of going to sleep. It was awful. Um, and again, that started happening like after the whole wedding scenario and being on my own and things and the thing that got me out of that was meditation within mm -hmm. a week I never had a panic attack again like it just stopped and it was at the point where you know I was really struggling with that it was really massively impacting my life negatively and that was eradicated by meditating just for five ten minutes a day so um, you weren't sitting there for hours on end no, meditating not at all no, no I was sat there Five, I was listening to guided meditation, so mm -hmm. there would be anywhere between five minutes and maybe 20 minutes in the la in the first few months, but starting very small, just building up that habit. Um, the other tool that I would use is journaling, and I, like, I harp on about journaling all the time because I think that has been the key to finding, like, who I... I know it sounds a bit cliche, but, like, it has been the key to finding who I am is through mm -hmm. journaling. Like it's I have, my favorite thing in the world. Oh, I've I've dug into parts of myself that I didn't even know existed through asking myself questions and really allowing it to come out. And that having that journal is like a just having like a best friend that is totally judgment free and you can say anything to them. They don't have an opinion on anything. It's just a a complete release of everything that you're holding on to. Yeah. I had a whole conversation on our, our beach walk this morning with my husband who doesn't write a thing other than a to-do list for his work or whatever, mm -hmm. no writing whatsoever. And we were talking about a situation he was having and I'm slowly trying to introduce him to concepts like, like mirroring. What is this situation reflecting back okay. at you? What, what are you harboring inside? Yeah. And his gut reaction, of course, is going to be like nothing, really? you know, <laughs> there, nothing, there's nothing yeah. there. Um, you know, I don't feel that way. I was like, I bet if you just spent 20 minutes just writing, not yeah. the first couple paragraphs, but keep writing until mm -hmm. something comes out. Yeah. And then you can burn it. Like it's not for yeah. anybody else. But when you start releasing what's inside, you can uh -huh. start discovering parts of you. Yeah. Like. Like, holy cow, the stuff that comes out when I'm writing, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. I never thought of it that way. And you um, wouldn't think I'm the one who put the words on the paper. But when no, you start it, going, just stuff comes out. This is the thing is you, you don't, like you were saying then with your husband saying like, you don't know, you don't feel like that, but you don't really know until you start getting comfortable with just letting it out. Like, you know, and at first I think a lot of people mistake journaling for you know, writing a diary entry, which is fine. Like that's one type of journaling, but that isn't really what it is about. It, it's so much deeper than that when you're asking yourself those questions and then asking more about that one and more about that one and, and uncovering all this stuff that you've been suppressing and you didn't even realise was there. And you're just creating all that space to then let in stuff that you want and yeah. get rid of all the stuff that's not serving you any longer. And it, it's interesting that you said that then because... I have um, spoken to three men recently who have all reached out to me, and I know them all, but they're not close, you know, like the, the people that I know. And people do that sometimes. I'm sure you'll find the same thing is that people feel safe. If they feel like your energy is safe, they'll open up to you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nothing that you're saying or doing. It's, it is literally just your energy, and people feel safe around you, which I take as a massive massive compliment you know mm. that somebody would feel like that around me um and they've kind of contacted me and said how much they've been struggling with various things and the one thing that I've recommended to all of them including my ex <laughs> yeah. um, is journaling you know because 
you have no idea what, especially I think men are, are kind of generally speaking like, like raised to suppress it more than women. And when they start opening up, I think they get like a bit of a shock at, at what's actually lurks beneath the surface and what needed to come out to then move forward and grow from that. And it's just such a valuable tool for anyone at all, anyone at all. Absolutely. And sometimes it shows you things you need to continue to heal. And sometimes just the writing is the healing, just acknowledging it. And that's what I told him is, is if you fly, shine a flashlight on a shadow, it's no longer a shadow, like bring light to it and then you can release it. And, you know, I love all healing modalities, like Mm -hmm. all the things. And so that might like, Ooh, this has come up for me. I'm going to keep pursuing it this way. But for him, just write it, just write it down. Just let it out. Purging it all out uh, and just letting it out. And like you said before, uh, I always say to people like, you don't, if you don't feel safe, knowing that somebody's not going to read your journal. I know, like, not everybody lives on their own and, you know, you might be worried that somebody might see this or see that. Let it out and then burn it, like you said. Just get rid of it, like, get it out. Yeah, get it out and then get it gone, whatever. Yeah, it's like squeezing a spot and getting all the the shit out that you don't need and then your skin can heal. Like, it's, it's, you're holding on to all of that toxic stuff that you don't want to, you don't want to have in your, in your body and in your mind. Yeah, it's so true. Okay, so something else that came up that I wanted to talk to you about is a friend of mine and I were in the car a couple of months ago, and we were going to look at a house, like I work in real estate too, and uh, we were going to look at a house, and I was telling him about what I've been doing and the work I've been doing, and um, that it feels really good to be doing something more aligned with my purpose, and he kind of clapped back at me that... um, you know, pursuit of purpose is uh, a rich person's game. Mm. And I'm telling you, I have thought about it so many times since then. And it doesn't resonate with me at all because I know so many people living their purpose. Like my mother was a guidance Mm. counselor and 100,000% she yeah. felt that was her purpose was helping mm-hmm. these kids navigate, you know, high school and into college. And I know that you were called to be a teacher and mm-hmm. now to, you know, teach law of attraction and all yeah. of these things. So I want you to do the clapping back for me. Well, I think he needs a journal to start with. <laughs> right? Here's There's your something, journal. Something in there that needs purging. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I I understand the logic behind it because I think people have this perception of of your purpose having to be this like massive success and in lots of cases it is but your purpose could be like knitting hats for newborn babies at the hospital yeah. it could be baking or it could be raising children it doesn't have to be like a high flying job as such and I think people get the two mixed up. And obviously, things are potentially easier for you to do if you have a bit more wealth naturally, like if you're not having to work all the time. So Mm -hmm. I I totally get that. Like, But your purpose is anything that makes you feel alive. And you can do that whether you have money or not in most of the cases. So I've I've actually just recorded a book recommendation for the Vibe Tribe and I've got I've got my computer on it here and it's um a book called The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. Oh. And in that book is one page that I cannot find because it's got 4, 437 pages in. And that is the page that helped me to find my purpose and mm-hmm. it was what would you do for free because it doesn't feel like work, which kind of disproves this idea that you have to be wealthy to live out your purpose because if you would do it for free, then that isn't, you know, it's not like a a job or or anything like that. It's what makes you feel alive and, and what would you just do? What would you spend your time doing for free if you could because it doesn't feel like work? And for me... That was talking. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no, I'm already my nine year old's purpose. His purpose yeah. is talking. <laughs> yeah, like my mum always laughs at me because she's like, You're always out of breath. And I'm like, So long as talking, like it's just literally because I talk so fast and I'm constantly talking. Um, but that's very clear to me because I've been able to talk to anyone like since I was little. I would have all my reports would say she'd be much better if she could just stop talking <laughs> and this kind of having like ADHD and and flitting from one thing to another all my life the only one consistent thing that I've ever done in my life is be completely consumed and invested in everything self-development and manifestation and all of that stuff and I knew that that was the subject that I should be speaking about alongside people opening up to me naturally before any of this you know people would just come to me and tell me and ask me for advice even when I was little like you know like when I was a kid people would ask me that were older than me and there's little hints about what your purpose is and it doesn't always have to be paid so when I started my podcast you know that was my first step but I wasn't starting it thinking right how am I going to you know, make a living out of this, how am I going to become a millionaire? That, I feel like that will happen at some point because the work that I'm doing is of value and it's aligned with what I what my purpose is. Yeah. So if you're working in something that you're passionate about and that you love, then you're naturally going to be more successful and more abundant in every area because you don't feel like you're you know, grafting away all the time and, and feeling miserable. So if your purpose is raising children, then that isn't a, a rich man's thing, is it? You know, that's no, anybody no. can think about what they want to do that's, you know, let me reword word that. What would you do for free that doesn't feel like work? And to me, that is your purpose because it's the thing that makes you feel most alive. And you can probably, you can have more than one, you know. Yeah. It's not for sure. And thing. some of it might be like joy filled. And then like, mm -hmm. I am, I am really called to, to work with active people who are in active death or yeah. comas and pro provide mediumship and communication between the family and the dying. That's yeah. not like a, it's not something joy, that you but to be a talking to you. Yeah, but it is a purpose that I feel a soul yeah. tug to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I feel like when I listen to my inner voice, it is like you are a writer, but these are the experiences you need to have mm -hmm. to write about. Like your yeah. goal is to share these experiences, but yeah. you can't share them without having them. So then mm -hmm. you have to go and you have to do these steps. And so it's not like you can sit down and be like, okay, I'm listening. Let's write the book. It's like, yeah. no, you need to get trained and you have to go spend time, you know, at hospice or yeah. in hospitals or working, you know, like this is part of the yeah. steps and it's going to be hard. And I'm aware of that. And I have to take classes on managing my energy and and yeah. how to do this um but I know it's what I'm called to do you yeah know? when you're doing it you'll feel like fulfilled and and you'll feel yeah. like you've made a a difference and that that's it isn't it it's what makes you feel fulfilled and what makes you feel like you you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and that yeah. you're adding value to the world whatever mm -hmm. that might be whether it's baking a famous pie or whether it's raising children or whether it's running a a billion dollar company it doesn't matter what it is it, it's what what resonates with you yeah I think I think that's where the purpose debate gets messed up is a assuming it has to be your job mm -hmm. and b assuming it has to make you rich because yeah. it doesn't have to do either not at all I think if you have the opportunity which are, again going back to what you, you'd said if you have the opportunity to make that into your career um that's amazing it's a little bit more difficult though uh, you know and I am in that same stage at the minute where I'm doing two jobs because I've gone from doing my teaching but I'm not fully in this yet so I've got like a foot in both camps of where I'm, I'm putting a lot of energy into the vibe tribe into my podcast and but I still have to you know I have to work and I have to do all of that stuff as well um but, but don't that, you see like that as such a uh, sorry for interrupting you? Don't no, no. you see like 
teaching was part of your practice for teaching. Yeah. Like, okay, your students grew up a little, but you needed to go and learn how to relate your experiences and your material for new listeners. And not everybody who's going to show up to you has read all the books and done all the work. So you have to translate your information to them. The funny thing about that is that um, I actually went to I could never decide what I wanted to do because I felt like very like I was lacking my purpose I couldn't decide what it was and I was I think a lot of people struggle with that um probably because we're so disconnected from ourselves that we don't mm. listen to what makes your heart sing that you you're listening to what everybody else is telling that you should do and you you're very motivated by paying your bills and you know it's all about keeping up with the Joneses basically so you become disconnected to what you want. And at the time, I was watching a lot of One Born Every Minute. This is a while ago. You know, the, the um, we have a program over here called One Born Every Minute, which is like a basically a documentary about a maternity ward. Um, and it was a really big hit in England. So I've been watching a bit of, of that. I got completely obsessed. I was like, right, I'm going to be a midwife. I want to be a midwife. Mm-hmm. And that was because I'd worked in office jobs and things like that and I'd always had this real like internal struggle that I'd be sat there and I'd be like if I just walked out now nobody would notice I'm not doing anything that is purposeful like I'm not making any difference and it would plague me that I I felt like I just wasn't doing anything that was worthwhile and that really bothered me so then I got really into this program I was like obsessing over it and I was like right I'm gonna be a midwife I'm gonna go to college so I went back did all my like um, qualifications to get into uni. And then on the day that I signed up to uni, I was like, I need to be a teacher. Now, it was completely out of my scope that I was going to be a teacher because my mum was a teacher and I thought, you must be mad. And I just had this overwhelming push to literally sign on the dotted line, midwife teacher, midwife teacher. And I did that. And I kind of came home and thought, oh, shit, what have I done? Um, and I'd done two years of this midwifery stuff ready, and I was just pushed at the final moment to go into teaching, literally at the final moment. And I did that, and I learned so many skills that have enabled me to do what I'm doing now on purpose that I would not have got from doing what I thought I wanted to do in my head rather than listening to my intuition and, and going with where I was being directed yeah and that's something that I do very differently now is I will never ask somebody what they think I will ask myself what I should be doing and listen and follow Mm -hmm. that and I don't think you ever go far wrong if you do that you know and sometimes you're like hey groom and also hey intuition if y'all could just like give me advance notice Right. You don't have to wait until the last minute, but your intuition's yeah. like, I'm going to give her a chance to figure this out. Okay, no, <laughs> no, stop. You know, it's so funny that, like you say that, because at, at the time, I wasn't, even though I was very much into law of attraction and things like that, I was not what I would call spiritual or, mm-hmm. or on that path at the time. I was open to things, but stuff that I do now, the girl two years ago would have thought, cuckoo, like, you know, I wasn't that down with it. (laughs) And on the morning, um, I was with one of my friends at the time, and she said, oh, he's messaged you. Now, any other normal bride (laughs) would think, oh, it's going to be a nice, you know, lovely message saying, can't wait to see you. And I went, he's not coming like that and she was like what are you talking about she said no he'll be saying good morning and I went no he's not coming and I knew but I didn't consciously didn't have any clue but obviously subconsciously I must have known all, all along and it was so bizarre that everybody was like what are you talking about like don't be ridiculous because it wasn't you know in an alarming tone it was like oh he's messaged you and I was like he's not coming and I was right and it was yeah. like I wish I'd have listened because now when I look back or, well, I don't wish it, you know, it is what it is, but I, all the signs were there and I was so in my head that I wasn't paying any attention to what I was being shown and told, in you know, by my intuition. And that opened me up to the idea of, 
learning how to do that and becoming led me onto this path where I'm much you know I'm, I'm much further along on that spiritual path and I don't say that like you know like you know I'm oh I'm more spiritual than anyone at all everybody is but more aware and more open to yeah. listening to my inner guidance instead of everybody else and just the problem we all run around as the bride like all the to-dos yeah. and all the this and all the details and all the planning and all the trying to make everything perfect and yeah. we forget to be still and listen yeah like, just listen to your own voice what what are you being told and yeah. it is it's hard to create space for that pause and that's yeah. why practices like meditation and journaling are so Absolutely. important they're the two things that have connected me into myself and and made me be able to listen to that in a guide as you know I will use it for everything now I'll be like shall I turn left or right I'm lost left right off I go and it gets me there every time more than more than any sat nav could or asking somebody for directions because we have we all have this inner knowing that is greater than what we think it is that is trying its best to guide us all the time and I'm we're just thinking about it, it if I would even trust my soul to make directions in the car. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm right. not positive because I can get lost. I can get lost going to my home from somewhere I've been 3,000 times. So maybe I yeah. need to start listening or I, I'm not positive. Yeah. Uh, that's it's just, me a little. <laughs> it's such a sense of like comfort as well to me now that I can trust that everything is always working out for me. Like even, you know, where, like I'll, I'm trying to think of an example, but like if I'm stuck in traffic, for example, I'll, I'll be stuck there and then I'll see that somebody's had a crash later on and I think I would have been there. I remember, um, just as a quick example, but I was on a hen party once in Barcelona. Barcelona and party? Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, it's so weird, isn't it? That we have different Translating. Different names, yeah. yeah, so we was on this hen do and we'd... Um, I am a very poor bridesmaid, like I'm not good at arranging things at all. It's not my forte. And it was one of my best friend's weddings. And I thought, right, I'm going to have to book something like. So I booked this open top buzz thing that would give you a tour around. It was August. It was absolutely, or July, absolutely roasting hot, like horrendous heat. And I'd accidentally booked the um, like four hour trip. <laughs> Instead of the two hour trip and everybody was like sat on the bus with heat like heat stroke, like absolutely furious at me. Yeah. And then we got off the bus that we'd planned that we were gonna go to lunch. Um and we got off this bus and we went to the top of the Ramblers and sat down at some chairs outside a, a cafe. But because we'd been on this extra two hours that nobody had planned on, it was getting a bit late and we all just collectively said, actually, should we just go back to the hotel and just have a sleep and then we'll come out for some tea? So we got up and two minutes later, we saw all these ambulances flying past and didn't know what was going on. And that was the terrorist attack with the vans on the Ramblas and it had wiped out the whole of the shop, the, the restaurant that we were sat at and we were there. And then because I <laughs> had booked and... I think this is the weird concept is that sometimes things are happening that don't make sense on a timeline. Like I had booked that months ago, mm -hmm. but if I hadn't have booked that wrong ticket, it, it was all like a, a domino effect that would have had a Almost completely different like outcome. they know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They, they can see things and just like, oh, yeah. we need to put a hurdle here. We need a roadblock yeah. here because this isn't your path. Uh, um, absolutely. And yeah. that, that like protection, that's what I, I mean, like the sense of protection and that I feel mm -hmm. is massive. You know, I, I think of that as my guides and my, my angels and my intuition is always, even though it might look like it's going tits up at the time, it's always for my own protection and for my own higher good. And I see that now and it makes me feel a lot more relaxed when things go wrong because I think... Oh, it's all right. It's protection or it's redirection. Yes. But I assume like when I am driving and accidentally miss my exit and add 30 minutes onto our trip, it's like, mm 
thank you for whatever yeah. you just saved me from. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Like, or, or you'll like, you'll find something that you never would have seen if you'd have not taken right. the wrong turn that that's really significant. And you think it's, it, you kind of like take a, a bit of a step back in wonder and think, wow, this is so cool that like somebody is steering for me. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Thank you for the scenic route. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I'm going to link very welcome. your podcast and thank the you. Vibe Tribe information. I am a member of the Vibe Tribe. I am a listener of the podcast <laughs> and I am a huge fan of yours. You are thank authentic you and fun and positive, <laughs> not piggy. And, awesome. <laughs> and I adore you. Oh, thank you so much. I love that. Thank you. I'm very grateful to be on and it's uh, been lovely to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.